Let's read together from Ephesians chapter 4. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. This is the word of the Lord. Now listen, if you can identify with a story, they meet, something happens. For some of us, it will be instantaneously. For others, it would take some time to become aware of the fact that something has happened in this space. For some of us, Some of us, it won't happen with somebody, but with something. They fall for each other. They fall in love. No planning. It just happened. Everything changes. The way that they think about themselves and the things that were important to them aren't important to them anymore. Everything changed and they decide to say yes to each other. They make a commitment, but they had no idea what they were letting themselves into. After a while, a power struggle takes place. The yes becomes a yes, but if you do this, I would do this because old habits die hard. A a commitment is not enough. They've got to really dedicate themselves to this commitment that they've made. It's a journey towards unity. Because I've got old ways of thinking, old ways of doing. Um, I'm not used to spending my weekends this way. I'm not used to going to this places, meeting this people, spending time with this Everything changed. Can you identify with this pattern? Now I wonder whether the same thing doesn't take place with us in our relationship with Jesus. Now just listen to Paul's words. You've heard from Christ. You've learned about him. He's writing to Christians here. And he's telling them, I just want to remind you what happened to you. You've met him. You fell for him. You've made this commitment towards him. You're living with him now. But um, there's an old self emerging. There's a struggle taking place in you. An old self. And, And Paul calls it the flesh in other places, or the ego in Greek, when he talks about uh, you've got to crucify yourself, I am crucified, the I is ego is crucified. I love the Dutch expression, akkegeit. You know, I still have an akkegeit in me, an ego in me. And now it it's disrupts this relationship. No. I still want to do things the way that I used to do it. But this new connection that I have of love demands something else of me. I've got to give myself up. Things have got to change. I can no longer do certain things. Now, the first thing, not the first thing, but something that Paul implies in this, by by telling them this, is that they shouldn't doubt the fact that this experience they had with Christ is real. Just because you still have an old self, it's emerging. 
And I don't know why, but for a while, during the honeymoon phase in the relationship, it's as if all your addictions and attachments are, you've been delivered of them. But after a while, they just creep back into your way of living. Don't doubt the fact that you're a new creature, that you are created in the image of God and the likeness and, and you, that's the real you. But the old you has got to go. And the way to do it is not to deny the fact that you have an old self. Um, some people think that's the way to handle No, I don't feel that way. I won't do that. I just ignore the way, uh, the only thing that you didn't do is to deny it and it will grow. And the power of everything that you deny will become strong and overtake you. You'll be overwhelmed by those desires. And don't be very f- shocked when you realize that, but I can do things that I used to do. I can do things that Everybody else does. Because Paul's is writing to Christians and I tell, I want to talk to you about your lying. The way that you look at truth and handle truth. I want to talk about your foul mouths, the, your language. I want to talk to you about your sexual practices. I want to talk to you about your anger, your bitterness. Um, there's no splitting in this relationship. You can't say that this is just for me and this has to do with my relationship with God. When you commit it in this relationship, it entails everything of your life. I remember watching a movie, I can't remember the name of a couple that got to the place in their relationship when they started with a power struggle. And their solution was a you pass. Twice or three times a year, we'll give each other the permission to go wherever you want to, do whatever you want to, with whomever you want to, and we'll just keep quiet about it. Just to give each other the space to be yourself, to be who you can't be in this relationship. And unfortunately, we can't, not unfortunately, uh, it might sound like a wonderful idea and a, a wonderful way to live, but it actually harms the relationship in its deepest essence by living that way and doing that. Um, I'm, I'm telling you by that way that I can't be myself with you and that you can't help me. You can't do it for me. And of course, in our relationship with Christ, we're invited to become like him to integrate our lives, to become one, to become one in ourselves and with him. And today we looked at Paul's invitation not to steal anymore, but to work and to give. And I've got a little story, something that happened to me that perhaps is a good summary of what we're talking about today. I was attending a class and uh, our lecturer was the dean of the School of Psychology and he's a committed follower of Christ. Now, I remember him coming into the class and saying, I've got something important to share with you. It happened to me this morning and I just want to share it with you, if it's okay with you. You see, this morning I did a gospel contemplation on the parable of the Good Samaritan by Jesus. Now, what he meant by gospel contemplation is praying with your imagination. In a gospel contemplation, it's old worth praying in the church. You imagine yourself as one of the characters in a story. And first, through active imagination, you think of what other, how others would respond. But with practice, you'll, you'll experience passive imagination. Your, your, it would become like a movie. The characters would, without you thinking of what they must say or would say or might say, will start speaking to you. And he said, this morning, I was the rob- robber. In the story. But I want to tell you, I am the robber. I am the thief. And he said, I realized 
that a Levite and the priest in the story are also robbers because they robbed the guy that were in need of help by not helping him. They didn't do anything bad in a sense, but they didn't do the good that they should have done. And in that way, they did something bad. And when he said it, I couldn't help but to think of Ephesians 4.28 that we're sitting with at the moment. That that's Paul's, Paul says, you, just by not stealing doesn't mean that you're not a thief. Um, you are only a thief that are not in practice at the moment, but you are a thief. You're only not a thief if you start working and get something and start sharing it with people that are in need. Only then are you not a thief. And he said, I realized I robbed myself. I withheld things from myself that I should have given to myself. I've robbed my family, my wife, my daughter. I've robbed other people. I build a house and I make use of the cheapest labor possible. And I've, I didn't pay people with that, what I was supposed to pay them. I'm living in a house that's not my own. And I don't look after this house as if, as if it is my own. I'm robbing somebody. And he went on. And then he said, and he closed, I ask for the grace to become a compassionate person, to have a compassionate heart, to be aware of the needs around me and not to become blind or to turn my head away from what's happening around me. Look it in the face. And then I want to give and I ask God for the discernment to spend my energy wisely and to give to the people and to the needs of people that I should. And he closed off. And that's what our life with Christ is all about. It's becoming of aware of the no longer in our lives. And you would be amazed if you read the things that Paul talks about. It's about everything in our lives that would eventually be turned around, um, be made new. Things that you couldn't have imagined about. And by hearing the things that you shouldn't do, doesn't mean that uh, you're sinful and you're bad. And it's, listen, yeah, that's the stuff that's in your way, that's in the way of a love relationship. It's the stuff that's keeping you back. It's deceitful desires. You think that living with those desires for those things will give you life. It's deceitful. They promise what they can't give you. Let them go. It's the old way of doing and living and live into the new life with him that God has for you. Now, the second big thing is that we should do something useful, to, to use the words of Paul. So it's not just a matter of stop doing something. The way that you stop doing something is to do something useful. And we have a wonderful definition here of work. It is doing something useful by meeting the needs of other people. That's what Paul says. It has to do with work. It has to do with the needs of other people, meeting those needs, doing something useful, not just for the sake of money, but for the sake of meeting needs. I've got a friend and uh, the motto of his business is, we do good by doing good. He's got a long story of, of how he developed this philosophy. And it sounds like Paul to me when he starts talking about it. He said his whole focus is on the needs of people and then helping people with the needs that they have. And then to ask them a fair payment for the service rendered. And by that way, 
he built a flourishing business. He helped more than 2 million people in this country with loans for self-development that they couldn't get anywhere else. What a thing to do. And so I want to ask you to just to get in touch for a moment with your attitude towards work and your attitude towards the needs of other people and meeting those needs. Is it something positive? Does it, is it exciting? Does it give you energy? Or does it take energy away? I've discovered that so many of us as a negative attitude towards work. In fact, um, people think of heaven as a place where we won't work anymore. And of course, it's built an idea that uh, Adam and Eve sinned and because of their sin, God punished them and said, from now on, you've got to work. You know? And when we die, we will enter eternal rest. No more work. But we miss something big, that God actually worked. And God does not change. He worked before the fall. He's still working today. He's busy doing a lot of things. And he also rests. And it's a rhythm with which God lives that he's inviting us to join him in. You know, if you think of retirement as a time of rest, a third of my life, I'm going to just have a holiday. That's why I've worked so hard. You'll run into a deep depression. I mean, just talk to the people that try to do it and think this way. What happened to them? You've got to have a bigger purpose. You've got to be useful. Doing something useful. You've got to keep on working until you die. Of course, what you do and how you do will change with a certain phases of your life. But it is so important to keep on working. And um, now what Paul's also saying is not that that's the only thing that we should do. We should just work. Of course, it's a way that a lot of us live today. We offer everything that we have on the altar of our works, ourselves, our families. Our work becomes the place where we find our identity, where our values are shaped, you know. In other words, the way that we feel about ourselves, the way that we, uh, the way, things that we value in life. And of course, it can become a major addiction in our lives. And it's unfortunately addiction that people will applaud you for. Um, but it would rob you of yourself and others, of true life. Your life will eventually be ruined through any major addiction. So it's important, but it's not all important. It's not the only thing that's important. The why is very important, to share with those in need. Paul says, the one translation says that, We should never forget the poor. Never forget. We should remember them. And that doesn't really mean in the biblical sense just to think for a moment about them, to remember them. But it should be part of our awareness, our consciousness, the needs of other people. Um, We should see the needs and we should always be aware of the needs of other people. Um, if you start thinking and wondering, uh, now who is the poor? You might be on the road to rationalization. You know poor people when you see them and when you meet them. And of course, it, it's a big challenge here. Because we feel, and I think a lot of us, especially in the middle class, we feel that um, I don't give enough for my family. And that's my first responsibility. And of course it is your first responsibility, your family. But um, Paul also asked these Christians, and not all of them were rich, that they should give to the work of the Lord and they should give to the poor proportionally. 
out of what you have. It doesn't matter how much you get. It's what you do with what you get. Out of what you get, give something to the poor. And what should we give? Uh, and in the parable of the Samaritan, we could, we could see that that guy, the Samaritan, gave medical assistance, gave transport, housing. He connected him in a socially supportive environment. Um, he contributed financially. And of course, this is the stuff that the church should also be involved in helping the poor. I want to close with a story. I once met somebody, I had to do with somebody that didn't share my belief in God. In fact, he, he does not believe in a God. He described himself as spiritual, but not religious at all. But I was taken by his gratitude. He didn't try to be very thankful and to show his thanks, but it was just dripping out of him. And then for his respect for other people, and then he did something strange when we went to eat. He said, guys, before we eat, can I just remind you where this food comes from? And he talked about nature and our connection with nature and all the people that were involved in the processing and the transportation and everything, that we can have this food. And then again, he, he was just so thankful to the people and, and to nature, to Mother Earth, he said. And then he did something strange. He said, and I want to use this food to give me energy, to sustain my life. And I want to make a promise to you guys that I want to be as compassionate as I can be with the power and the strength that I get to make this world a better place. And at that moment, I thought of this parable that Jesus spoke about. And I couldn't help but to think, perhaps I'm more like the priest than I am like the Samaritan. You must remember in this parable, the Samaritan were the guy with the other faith, the other culture, the priest and the Levite were the guys that had the right faith. In, in, in theological terms, they had the right orthodoxy, orthodox particular, right doxy belief. But this other guy had the right practice, orthopraxis. And Jesus says, be like the Samaritan. Live with compassion and do it. And that's our invitation. I don't know where you are. Perhaps you're at a place where you're considering following Jesus. Uh, perhaps you're on the journey and you can feel the struggle between the old and the new within you. And you're invited to become like Jesus, compassionate. You're invited to look the needs of people and the people around you in the eye and your own needs. And you're invited to give, to work, to share. And in thus entering into a new kind of life. And that's what we ask. Let's take hands. Let's do this together. Let's encourage each other to care for our families, to care for the work of God by giving out of what we earn and to give to the poor and to serve the poor. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the kind of life that you inviting us to. Um, thank you for the new self that we have received. Help us to get in contact Help us in this journey towards our true self to put on this new man, this new self. Give us the power. Help us to renew our minds, to see the wonderful life that we can have, the free, joyous, compassionate life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive the grace of God. 
the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of the Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you. Amen.